Um, Ms. Hutchinson, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for nice being here. You. Thank you for having me, Rachel. This is um, the first live interview you've done in the media. It is the second live interview you have done in life. <laughs> the first one was <laughs> your <true>. testimony. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, it's, on, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And um, it's an honor to have this as my first live interview. <laughs> Well, it's second live interview, I guess. Second live interview. The first one, much more consequential than this one. Don't worry. Um, I mean, it's been 15 months since that testimony. Your life has changed dramatically since then. I said, um, based on what I read in your book, but I didn't ask you about this ahead of time, I said in my introductory remarks that a lot of the reason that people haven't heard from you or seen you out in the world in the last 15 months is at least in part because of concerns about your security. Is that fair? Is that still a real life concern for you? That's a fair assessment, yes. How are you taking care of yourself in that regard? I mean, you don't have to tell me anything I shouldn't no, know. No, no, you're yeah. fine. Uh, yeah. I've open book. Uh, you know, it's been difficult in a lot of ways. But it's also, it's open, this year has been a, has helped me open my eyes to the dangers that Trump actually poses on people in these situations. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the only one. And I, I wish I could say I'd be the last person, but unfortunately I won't. And that's, that's what he does to people that he thinks that, speak out against him or, or that detract from him. And it's one of the more dangerous things about Donald Trump, too. This is something we've seen time and time again, and it, we, it shouldn't have to be like this. You write about, in the book, repeatedly, about your regret as ha for having not supported him, um, but specifically for having facilitated some of the political attacks that he launched as president on people that were designed the way he designs them, to hurt people maximally and in some cases to expose them to danger. Did that give you any in, any insight into why he needs politics to work that way for him and uh, any insight into how to combat it? It gave me an insight into his psyche while I was writing the book and helping understand my circumstances with it mm -hmm. and what I dealt with after I testified. Um, you know, but with that said, he it, it helped also open my eyes to what he wants from people. He wants to know that he's getting a reaction. He thrives when he has an audience. It could be a negative audience. It could be a, an audience that he likes. It, it, it could be his base. But what he needs is to hear people reacting to him. And that's when he knows in his mind that he has been successful to something. Is that why you've never responded to his attacks on you? I've never responded to his attacks on me because I don't need to give them oxygen. He is going to say what he's going to say, and he said much worse things about much better people than I am. Um, the kind of pressure that you describe experiencing to protect Mr. Trump, I mean, some of it was self-directed, right? You, you say at one point in the book, um, and it struck me, you said that you adored him mm -hmm. at one point, um, that you were, very, you were and are very much still a Republican, that you believed in what he was trying to do for the country. You wanted to be a good staffer. You wanted to serve the White House. You wanted to do right by your colleagues. Um, and that sort of, sort of easily leads toward the next post-presidential project for him, which is protecting him from all the investigations around January 6th and everything else. But that pressure not only came from you, it also came from his world. You didn't have financial resources to hire your own lawyer. You didn't have access to a lawyer at the outset who would represent you for free. You ended up with a Trump world lawyer who you describe as having not told you to lie but encouraged you to not tell everything that you knew. Um, that pressure is very, it's not just a Cassidy Hutchinson biographical detail, it is a live issue for a lot of people right now. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people in multiple jurisdictions deciding if they are, how they're gonna respond to a subpoena, what, they're, what they may testify to in court, what they're gonna do about their legal representation. This is a live issue for a lot of people right now. And some of them may be watching right now what would you say to them about how to balance the equities in that kind of a calculation? In my opinion, you know, I don't know if there really is a way to balance the equities. If you have a self-interest of being completely forthcoming and truthful in what you're witnessing that could potentially hurt or damage Mr. Trump, um, and not even speaking to the issues of legal counsel, just as a person knowing what I experienced. And like you said, some of it was self-inflicted for me. I, I did, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew how I felt about these circumstances surrounding January 6th. But I also 
was scared, to be frank. I was scared at times to make that break. Mm -hmm. I had seen what happened to some of my, my former colleagues who had made that break and how they became the subjects of the vitriol and the vile rhetoric that comes out of Mr. Trump and his associates when you break with him. If I were to say anything to the people, though, that may be finding themselves in a similar situation to the situation that I found myself in or just that they want to make that break, it, it's possible. You know, we can't... And what I think is, in my opinion, again, what I think is damaging in ways is isolating the people that come out and then questioning why they did. It's, it is hard to come out. It was hard to find my way out because of what we said. You know, I, I had financial limitations and I did have other counsel. But it was also hard coming out on the outside because I didn't know if I'd be welcomed by people. Hmm. Um, so I think that, you know, if we can cr create and foster an environment where people feel that they're welcomed and that there is a life on the other side, mm -hmm. which is one of the more eye-opening parts of this experience for me, too, is that like, there are good people in this world <laughs> that want to help and that are there and that have similar interests that we do, that we all want the republic to survive. We all should want this republic to survive. Um, but in the way that, that Mr. Trump's trajectory currently is going, you know, I'm not confident that he will have it survive. And you know, I would just encourage them to think about that. When you say that, um, we speak at a moment when Mr. Trump is dozens of points ahead of his nearest opponent in the Republican presidential primary. Um, the tone in the political press about what's happening in the Republican presidential primary is that even people who support um, his competitors are effectively conceding that he's going to be the nominee. Republicans seem poised to choose him again, even after what happened the last time and specifically what you were able to tell the country about what it was like inside the White House. I was struck in the book, not just about what you said about January 6th, but some of the other ways that you described what was bad about him as a president. On COVID, you said, I doubt any politician could have led the country through the deadliest pandemic in 100 years without making errors of judgment and execution. But of all the people in the world, President Trump was uniquely unsuited to the challenge. He lacked empathy and was stubborn and impatient. Um, you said he had a restless, impulsive personality. You described um, his attention span not being up to an average meeting. I noticed that his eyes often wandered the room when the meetings outlasted his attention span. Ultimately, you described what happened on January 6th is from him, at a minimum, a shocking dereliction of duty. I mean, all of the things that you described from having seen him up close are public record now. Right. None of these things are secrets. Why do you think... Um, your fellow Republicans want him more than they want anybody else as their next candidate for the White House. I can't speak to the psyche of my, I won't say my fellow Republicans, because I do not think that we are a part of the same Republican Party. I still consider myself a, a Republican. I consider myself a Republican in the sense of Senator Mitt Romney and the Reagan Republican Party. I believe that the Republican Party needs a strong conservative party. I do not believe that Mr. Trump is a strong Republican. But in this next election cycle, it's, in my opinion, it's the make or break moment for the Republican Party. Now is the time if these politicians, these men and some women that are currently in Congress want to make the break and want to take the stand, they have to do it now. You, we can't wait any longer for them to do it. I don't know why they're so will, so willing to support him. Um, I think it's extremely disappointing, and it is not a hard issue to take. It's we're talking about a man who, at the very essence of his being, almost destroyed democracy in one day, and he wants to do it again. He wants to run for president to do it again. He's been indicted four times since January 6th. I would not have a clear conscience and be able to sleep at night if I were a Republican in Congress that supported Donald Trump. And, you know, I think that if they're not willing to split with that, then we're in serious danger for the party.